From New York, this is Democracy Now! For a second republic and to liberate Algeria from traitors' hands, we are against the elections with the current government. We don't want traitors anymore. We don't want an Algeria like the one of today anymore. As mass protests continue across the globe, from Chile to Hong Kong and from Haiti to Iraq and Lebanon, we go to Algeria, where demonstrators have taken to the streets every Friday for nine months. Then we look at the crackdown on activists in Saudi Arabia as the U.S. Department of Justice files charges against two former Twitter employees with helping the Saudis spy on critics of the kingdom. Then the pollinators. The reason honeybees are here in the first place is to pollinate our crops, you know, because one out of every three bites of food we put in our mouths is, comes from honeybee pollination. I think the general public should know that our food system is threatened by the fact that the bees are in trouble. And they should care about that because they eat food. A new documentary looks at how the world is facing the worst mass bee extinction event ever seen. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Televised impeachment hearings against President Trump are scheduled to begin Wednesday. The leading witness will be William Taylor, the top American diplomat in Ukraine. He's previously testified to House investigators there was a quid pro quo making the release of U.S. military aid to Ukraine conditional on Ukraine investigating Trump's political rival Joe Biden and his son Hunter. On Wednesday, House investigators released the transcript from Taylor's closed-door testimony. One of the key takeaways, Taylor said it was Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani's, idea to have Ukraine's president commit to the investigations into the Bidens. The Washington Post is reporting President Trump wanted Attorney General William Barr to hold a news conference declaring Trump broke no laws during his July 25th phone call with the Ukrainian president, which is at the center of the impeachment inquiry. Attorney General Barr reportedly refused to do so. On Wednesday, President Trump lashed out at Democrats over the impeachment inquiry during a rally in Monroe, Louisiana. But Democrats must be accountable for their hoaxes and for their crimes. Now, corrupt politicians Nancy Pelosi and shifty Adam Schiff <laughs> and the crooked media have launched the deranged, delusional, destructive, and hyperpartisan impeachment witch hunt. Now we go again. In election news, the San Francisco district attorney race still remains too close to call, although latest results show interim district attorney Susie Loftus pulling ahead of public defender Chesa Boudin. Boudin is the child of weather underground activists Kathy Boudin and David Gilbert and ran on a platform of ending cash bail and dismantling the war on drugs. Some San Francisco leaders have accused the Police Officers Association of trying to buy the district attorney's race, accusing the officer Officers Association of spending up to $650,000 in ads attacking Boudin. Meanwhile, former Attorney General Jeff Sessions says he will announce today he's planning to run for his old Alabama Senate seat. The primary race would likely pit Sessions against accused sexual predator Roy Moore, who lost to Democrat Doug Jones after several women came forward accusing Moore of sexually abusing them when they were underage. In Massachusetts, Democratic Congresswoman Ayanna Presley has backed Senator Elizabeth Warren's presidential campaign. Presley becomes the only member of the so-called squad of four young progressive congresswomen to endorse Elizabeth Warren. The other three, Alexandria Casio cortez of New York, Ilhan Omar of Minnesota and Rashida Tlaib of Michigan, have all endorsed Senator Bernie Sanders. Meanwhile, Warren is continuing to come under fire from billionaires. On Wednesday, Bill Gates implied he was working worried about how much money he would have left over under Warren's tax plan. The Microsoft founder has over $100 billion. In response, Warren tweeted at Gates, offering to sit down with him and explain exactly how much he'd pay under her proposed 6 percent tax on the richest Americans. On Friday, Democracy Now! will be broadcasting the first-ever presidential forum on environmental justice at South Carolina State University in Orangeburg. Candidates taking part will be Senators Elizabeth 
Warren and Cory Booker, businessman Tom Steyer. The forum begins at 6 p.m. Eastern. I'll be moderating with former EPA official Mustafa Ali, and we'll be live streaming at democracynow.org. We'll also be broadcasting on stations across the country. In Syria, President Trump has approved an expanded military mission to secure a 90-mile expanse of oil fields in the eastern part of the country, meaning hundreds of U.S. troops will remain in Syria. This comes despite President Trump's repeated claims he was bringing the troops home. The mission complicates the U.S. troops' role in Syria and could bring them into direct confrontation with the Russian or Syrian military. Virginia Democratic Senator Tim Kaine condemned Trump's decision, saying, quote, "...risking the lives of our troops to guard oil rigs in eastern Syria is not only reckless, it's not legally authorized. President Trump betrayed our Kurdish allies that have fought alongside American soldiers in the fight to secure a future without ISIS, and instead moved our troops to protect oil rigs." Unquote. CNN's reporting, Defense Secretary Mark Esper is planning to urge President Trump not to intervene in the cases of U.S. soldiers facing war crimes allegations. Trump has already ordered a review of the charges against Army Lieutenant Clint Lawrence and Army Green Beret Major Matt Goldstein. Clint Lawrence is serving a 19-year murder sentence in the military prison at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, for ordering soldiers to open fire on unarmed Afghan motorcyclists in 2012. Matthew Goldstein Goldstein is facing murder charges related to the 2010 killing of an alleged Afghan bomb maker. He reportedly told CIA interviewers he'd shot the unarmed man and then destroyed his body in a burn pit on the military base. Trump is also reportedly considering restoring the rank of Navy SEAL Eddie Gallagher, who's been accused of multiple war crimes, including shooting two Iraqi civilians and fatally stabbing a captive teenager in the neck. A California jury acquitted him of murder charges in July. A federal judge has voided the Trump administration's so-called conscience rule, which would have allowed health care workers to refuse to offer medical care to patients, including abortions, if the procedures conflicted with the health care workers' private religious beliefs. The rule would have also allowed these medical workers to refuse to refer patients to other health care providers who could carry out the procedures. The now-voided rule was part of the Trump administration's broader effort to limit access access to abortion. A new ProPublica investigation reveals how Vice President Mike Pence's office interfered with foreign aid programs in order to reroute the money to Christian groups abroad, particularly in Iraq. The investigation reveals how longtime officials worry that the White House interference in USAID funding programs could be unconstitutional because it favored one religion, Christianity, over others. The officials also worried that perceptions that the U.S. was favoring some religious groups could worsen sectarian divisions in Iraq. The Department of Justice has charged two former Twitter employees with spying for Saudi Arabia by accessing private user data and giving it to Saudi officials in exchange for payment. The charges were unveiled Wednesday in San Francisco. One Twitter employee, Ahmed Abu Amo, has already been arrested. Meanwhile, California has sued Facebook for documents related to California's investigation into Facebook's privacy policies. California's probe into Facebook began last year following the revelations that voter profiling company Cambridge Analytica harvested the data of more than 50 million Facebook users without their permission in efforts to sway voters to support President Donald Trump. Trump. Facebook's also paid the Federal Trade Commission $5 billion to settle a case over Facebook's data sharing with Cambridge Analytica. The New Zealand Parliament has approved landmark climate legislation that commits New Zealand to zero carbon emissions by 2050. This is New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. Our world is warming. And so, therefore, the question for all of us is what side of history will we choose to sit on in that moment in time? I absolutely believe and continue to stand by the statement that climate change is the biggest challenge of our time. And for us here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that means for this generation, this is our nuclear moment. Yeah. 
In Mexico, new details are emerging about the massacre of the American-Mexican Mormon family in the northern state of Sonora. Three women and six children were killed when gunmen ambushed their SUVs as they traveled along the highway. Experts have determined the ammunition used in the attack was manufactured in the United States by American weapons manufacturer Remington. Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador has announced he's impaneling an investigation. López Obrador ran on a campaign promise of ending Mexico's U.S.-backed drug war and improving security. But the homicide rate this year is on track to hit a record high threatening public support for the president's long-term strategy of reducing cartel violence through social and educational programs. This is Julian LeBaron, a member of the American-Mexican Mormon community. The whole family wants to know exactly who the attackers were and why they did it. And we don't want the government to manipulate the facts. And we want no lies. During yesterday morning's media conference by Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador, they came out to say that the victims were in the middle of crossfire, but they don't even have the facts of what happened. We, the family, arrived at the crime scene before members from Sonora's public prosecutors arrived, who did not even show up, and public prosecutors from the state of Chihuahua, the same. We live in an area where criminals do as they they wish, and authorities don't even defend women or children. Over 100 people are murdered in Mexico every day. Six of the children survivors of the attack on the Mormon American Mexicans are in a Tucson hospital. In New York City, immigration activist Marco Saavedra is heading to his final asylum hearing today, where he'll argue his life would be at risk if he's sent to Mexico. Saavedra has been involved in several high-profile immigration actions. In 2012, he purposely got himself arrested by federal authorities to infiltrate the privately owned Broward Transitional Center in Florida, an immigration jail run by GEO, in order to investigate firsthand allegations of human rights abuses inside the secretive facility. This is Marco Saavedra explaining how he got arrested for the action. I got arrested undercover. I had to lie and say that I was a recently arrived undocumented immigrant, that I was looking for my cousin that was also a day laborer, and I flashed my Mexican matricula and as baits, uh, which the Border Patrol agent had to take and asked me, he asked me directly, are you undocumented? As soon as, soon as he said that, I said, in broken English, Spanglish, yes, see. Si. And he said, I, you know, I have to arrest you now. And we have the audio of that, too, on file, uh, where he arrests arrest me. And that's our entry point into the Broward Transitional Center, which housed 600 uh, undocumented immigrants of low priority for detention, uh, which we wanted to in infiltrate. As we broadcast this program, Marco Saavedra is standing on the steps of 26 Federal Plaza in New York, holding a news conference before he goes in for his hearing. Visit democracynow.org to see our full interview with Marco Saavedra. And in media news, New York's longtime community-supported radio station WBAI is back on the air with local programming. On Wednesday, a state judge restored the radio station to local control. In October, the Pacifica Foundation abruptly laid off WBAI's staff and ended local programming, setting off a legal battle over the future of the station. WBAI is one of five stations in the Pacifica Radio Network, which was founded in 1949 by the peace activist Lou Hill. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We begin today's show in Algeria, where protests against corruption, the jailing of opposition leaders and the army's powerful role in national politics have now entered their ninth month. Tens of thousands of protesters filled the streets of the capital Algiers last Friday to mark the 65th anniversary of the War of Independence from France and to demand a new revolution. Demonstrators have denounced the upcoming December elections, saying they'll be rigged. For a second republic and to liberate Algeria from traitors' hands, we are against the elections with the current government. We don't want traitors anymore. We don't want an Algeria like the one of today anymore. 
Last month, the Algerian government intensified its crackdown on demonstrators in advance of next month's elections, with over a hundred student protesters arrested. Interim President Abdelkader Ben Salah announced the country will hold a presidential election on December 12th. Longtime President Abdul Aziz Bouteflika resigned in April following weeks of protests. Tens of thousands of mostly young people have marched every Friday, demanding remaining members of the ruling elite also step down before any new elections. Elections planned for July were canceled after protesters said they would be controlled by the army and the ruling elite. Well, for more, we're joined by two guests. Mehdi Casey is an Algerian-American activist who organized a protest last weekend in San Francisco in support of Algerians in Algeria. And Daika Dridi is a journalist based in Algiers. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Let's go directly to Algeria, to Algiers. Daika, explain what's happening in the streets, why the protests began, um, the forcing out of the president, and what people are calling for right now. It all began on uh, February the 22nd. It came completely as a surprise to everybody. People just rushed out on the streets a Friday after the prayer. Uh, it was a, a week or so after President Bouteflika announced uh, through a uh, letter, because he is actually sick, he's paralyzed, he had a stroke in 2013, and has been unable to talk or move or uh, actually govern since 2013, but kept on being president. So after the announcement of Bouteflika running for a fifth term after 20 years in uh, ruling the country, so like uh, 10, a week or 10 days after that, people poured out on the streets of Algeria everywhere, in the capital, in all the big cities, demanding that he step down, saying, no more of you, we don't want you anymore, this is the end of it. And the, the storm was so big, but very, very peaceful, that it took everybody by surprise, and it, the people kept on demonstrating in a very peaceful manner every Friday, and the students actually decided that they will uh, demonstrate. They will have their own demonstrations on Tuesdays. So it became a ritual ever since the 22nd of February. The Algerians are on the street every Tuesday, every Friday by tens of thousands, demanding, first they were demanding that Bouteflika step down, and then they were demanding a radical change. They want democracy. And th this is why people are, st are still on the streets. This is why, um, even though President Bouteflika resigned on April the 2nd, uh, the Algerians didn't go back home and kept on, demonstra and on demonstrating. It is really important to understand that what's happening in Algeria is um, there is something, there is uh, like a political uh, uprising, but there is also like a huge sense of pride, of self-love that the Algerian people are experiencing. And you, you, that's, I think, personally, that I think that's what's keeping them on the streets, they were not answering the calls of political organizations. They were not uh, calling the answers of any uh, unions or uh, or uh, political parties or opposition. They were just answering the call of what they call their dignity, and it's still going on until now. Because after the resignation of the president, the army decided to keep through the through the. Uh, the chief of staff of the army, who is the, uh, the general uh, Ahmed Gaid Saleh, uh, to make as if the only issue was to remove Bouteflika and remove all the corrupt businessmen who were, uh, uh, who were at the time of Bouteflika. But the Algerians are wanting a much, much deeper uh, change, and they're not going back home. So it's um, the demonstrations are happening, and it is um, it's it's pretty incredible to see how joyous, how fun they are, and how the, the proud of like 
people for being like peacefully determined, no matter how long it would take them to get rid of the entire system. Daicha, as you said, it was the army chief of staff, uh, it was at his behest that uh, Bouteflika was forced to resign. Can you talk about the role of the military uh, uh, historically in Algeria and what role they're playing now? Was the military responding to the protests or were there internal reasons that they wanted Bouteflika out? Oh, no. The, the military never wanted Bouteflika out. They were completely uh, pressured by the, the uprising to, uh, to take him out. He, Bouteflika actually uh, came and saved the military. The military has a historic rule. He's, they, they are mostly the, the generals who are ruling Algeria since the independence are uh, all uh, veterans of the Algerian in war of independence against the colonial France. Um, so, but they've been they've been they've been ruling the country basically uh, most of the time behind behind a, a civilian facade, and this is the first time in history where the civilian facade is gone. They made Bouteflika resign, thinking that that will uh, calm the people and make them go back to their homes and just get uh, back to ordinary life. But they did not actually understand that the people who are on the streets want a real, a real change. They don't just want, like, uh, uh, just a masquerade, uh, what they usually do, like, try to change a, a top level here and a top level there. They just want a real... They, they want the rule of law. They want free elections. They want free press. They they want dignity back. That's and, that's exactly what people are talking about and, on the streets. And uh, if you could talk about the uh, crackdown on journalists, you yourself are a journalist, but yes. also the effects of the protests in Lebanon and Iraq, um, the mass uprising for a moment recently um, in Egypt. But what kind of effect this is having on Algeria, and what kind of effect did Algeria have beginning these protests months ago on the other countries? Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, the Algerian uprising happened long before uh, uh, the, the ones that are happening now in Lebanon and, uh, and the one that was uh, uh, hugely repressed in Egypt happened last month. Um, what, what, what's happening is that the Algerians um, did, not, did not think that did not think themselves that this was possible <coughs> to just like to to just go, go on the street because it was always uh, heavily repressed but the, they they discovered that there was a way for them to to protest to protest in a very clever uh, and peaceful manner just being on the streets twice a week and like also passively uh, not accepting uh, the the ministers' visits to their towns, and the, all the represent all the representatives of the states are not uh, welcome anymore. So th they discovered a new force, and they are like happy to use it, even though the there is there is a repression. The repression is not bloody. The, Al the Algerian army uh, did not. Uh, there were no uh, orders to shoot. Uh, the the protesters and uh, until now there was no there was only one casualty that happened in uh, April the second. Um, uh, so the, 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 what's happening in uh, in Algeria is just completely uh, is very like uh, new to the Algerians themselves and new to uh, what's what's happening around them. So I, they are also interested. In, they were. The Algerians were very curious about what was going on in Sudan. Sudan, the Sudanese protesters uh, were on the streets at the same time uh, in February also and in March as the Algerians. And now they're looking at what's happening in Lebanon and Iraq. And the hopes is that uh, actually to keep Algeria on the safe ground of peaceful protests 
and hoping that the repression never go into uh, violent uh, crackdowns against the demonstrators. But Daicha, is are the protesters now calling? As you said, the army is now ruling more brazenly, more transparently than ever before. Are the protesters making specific demands about the role of the military in Algerian politics? And could you also talk about uh, the number of political prisoners that are now being held uh, in Algeria who've been involved in these protests? Yes. The, 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 the slogans are very, very clear. There is no, like, uh, uh, there is nothing uh, tacit or implicit in the protesters' slogans. At the beginning, they were not, um, they were trying to uh, keep the army, um, how to say, to give the army a chance not to be in a face-to-face -face with the population. But now they are just telling the chief of army uh, the, the, the chiefs of the army staff, uh, uh, the general Ahmed Gaid Saleh, to step down because they think it's been eight months that they've been demanding uh, democracy. And the only thing he's been uh, trying to impose is uh, an election that is not, the, for, in, for which there are no guarantees for people. It's not, it's not, it's not going to be democratic. It's not going to be free. So they, they want, they, the slogans are very, very nasty to the general. His name is in the, in the protest. The generals as a category are in the slogans. There is a very famous slogan that is half in French, half in Arabic, the Algerian style, that says, les généraux à la poubelle, le jazair, l'istiklal. The generals to the trash bin, Algeria takes back its, its, its independence. So the Algerians are referring, actually, a lot to the history of the war of independence. I think, personally, it's because, for them, it's, the, it's a matter of pride. They are telling those rulers who, for them, cheated them, uh, taking over the country, imposing a dictatorship, uh, telling them we are the direct descendants of the heroes who got the country rid of colonial friends, and we will get rid of you, too. And finally, so, Daika, the Committee to Protect Journalists calling on Algerian authorities to release journalist Benjama Mustafa to end the harassment of journalists covering anti-government protests. Mustafa arrested last month at the office of the French language Le Provincial, where he served as editor-in-chief, CPJ, saying it's documented the arrest of at least four other journalists who are covering the national national protests. There are Middle East and North Africa coordinator Sharif Mansour saying in a statement, Algerian authorities must immediately and unconditionally release Benjama Mustafa and all other journalists arrested in recent months. Millions of Algerians have taken to the streets to have their voices heard, and the press should be allowed to cover this period of national importance without fear of retaliation. What about the crackdown on journalists? We just have 20 seconds before we move to our guests in San Francisco. Yes, the, the crackdown on—they they, they crack down on journalists who are very involved in the coverage of the protest. Uh, Mustafa has been released. He's, uh, he's out of jail. But uh, there are th four others who are still in prison. And they are in prison because of their uh, ongoing uh, coverage of the protests and because of their involvement in uh, uh, defending human rights in Algeria. And hundreds of others have been arrested as well, right, who are continuing no, no, we, to no, be no, held of not protesters, hundreds, not, of protesters. Not, not, not hundreds of others, no. There are all in all 200, uh, m more or less 200 uh, political detainees. Most of them are protesters, but uh, some of them are political figures uh, and uh, activists who were arrested at home. Um, but most of them were grabbed during the demonstrations. Well, I'd like to bring in uh, Mehdi Casey. Mehdi, uh, can you talk about the role of youth uh, uh, in these protests and why specifically they've been involved, levels of unemployment and inequality, etc.? What's driving this huge youth participation in the protests? Yes, hi, Namidin, and Amy, thank, and thank you for having me. Uh, so the youth have definitely um, uh, um, a different view on the situation in Algeria. Um, what's going on currently in Algeria is really due to a uh, huge differential difference uh, in the uh, uh, gener generational gap 
uh, between the two groups. And what I mean by the two groups is the rulers, who are basically uh, most of them over 80 years old, and the youth, who are uh, who represent demographically uh, about 70 percent of the population. And uh, those are groups who are basically under 35. Uh, like you mentioned, they're unemployed, um, and if they're students, they have no uh, hope of finding a job after they graduate. Um, and then, uh, with this revolution, what is interesting is that they've certainly, the Algerian people have certainly been, um, 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 if, you, if you like, uh, aware of what's been going on in Algeria for the last 20 years under the Bouteflika regime. But what's interesting this year is that the youth have uh, actually used the technologies, such as Facebook, Twitter, and the uh, mobile technology to take videos, pictures, and go online uh, very quickly to uh, um, basically uh, uh, um, unite and uh, organize uh, uh, against the, the state. Protests you're holding in San Francisco, the Algerian diaspora, and what you're calling for here. Yes, we're. Uh, I think uh, you uh, mentioned some of the um, um, IGC, um, uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, us, the diaspora here in uh, California in particular, but in general, we're actually working with different groups, collectives, uh, not only in the United States, but also in Canada, in Ottawa and Montreal. Uh, there are also groups we're working with in Paris, Brussels and London and other cities within, in France where there is a, a diaspora. And what we're asking is really uh, we're in sol solidarity with the Algerian people. Uh, what we want is mainly the immediate release uh, and unconditional release of all political prisoners. We also want the end of repression on the media, and particularly the uh, uh, activist uh, activist uh, journalists in the uh, on, on the internet, such as YouTube, uh, Facebook, or Twitter. We also want the cancellation of the elections on December 12th, which I which we all think that they are illegally um, uh, being. Uh, uh, scheduled, and then uh, finally, uh, we want the initiation of a transitional period uh, in order for Algeria to move to uh, a better uh, democratic process, so that Algerians can live uh, um, in freedom and uh, well, enjoy their liberties. We yes. want to thank you both for being with us, Mehdi Casey, Algerian American activist, speaking to us from Berkeley, California, and Daika Dridi, a journalist based in Algiers, Algeria. Thank, this is Democracy thanks, thank Now. You for having us. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, when we come back, um, we're going to be talking about what's happening in Saudi Arabia. A new report out this is the U.S. Justice Department goes after uh, some employees at Twitter who are spying for the Saudi regime, the Justice Department says, um, against protesters. Stay with us. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. The U.S. Department of Justice has charged two former Twitter employees with helping Saudi Arabia spy on thousands of people, including critics of the kingdom. The Twitter employees are accused of giving the Saudi government detailed information about users, including telephone numbers and email addresses linked to the accounts, as well as Internet protocol addresses that could be used to identify a user's location. The charges are being filed just over a year after the brutal murder of Saudi journalist and critic Jamal Khashoggi, who was killed inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey. We turn now to a scathing new report by Human Rights Watch on Saudi Arabia, which finds one one year after Khashoggi's brutal murder, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's kingdom continues to arbitrarily detain countless activists, regime critics and clerics. The report says there's a darker reality behind uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman's wide
widely touted initiatives for Saudi women and youth, including mass arrests of women activists, some of whom have allegedly been sexually assaulted, tortured with electric shocks. Despite Saudi Arabia's human rights record, several top Trump administration officials recently joined financial industry executives at a Saudi investment forum known as Davos in the Desert. U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, President Trump's son-in-law, senior advisor Jared Kushner, led the U.S. delegation. Other attendees included Stephen Schwartzman, CEO of Blackstone Group, Dina Powell McCormick of Goldman Sachs, and Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock. We're joined now by Adam Kugel, Middle East researcher at Human Rights Watch, author of the new report titled The High Cost of Change, Repression Under, Under Saudi Crown Prince Tarnishes Reforms. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thanks so much for being with us, Adam. Start off with this whole issue of uh, the Justice Department um, going after the former Twitter employees for spying on dissidents in Saudi Arabia. What do you know? Well, the Justice Department yesterday uh, revealed indictments of uh, three Saudis, uh, for uh, two of them Twitter employees, for allegedly uh, essentially accessing uh, particular information on users uh, at the request of the Saudi government. What I find really unique about this situation is that they've identified the person who was essentially handling the Twitter employees as a very, very close confidant of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. His name is Badr al Asakr, and he is the head of MBS's uh, personal office, as well as the head of his, his charity called the Misk Foundation. Uh, and what's also interesting about this situation is, is how far back this goes. Uh, so in 2014, uh, MBS really hadn't risen on, on the scene of Saudi politics yet. He was still uh, kind of a, a rather anonymous prince. His father was the crown prince and defense minister, but he was sort of a, a, a minor official working for his father. Uh, yet at the same time, it does appear uh, that somebody from, from his circle uh, was making these contacts at Twitter and requesting user information. And it appears to me from the indictment that uh, around the time that King Abdullah died on January 23rd, 2015, uh, that these contacts uh, sort of uh, increased, and, and you can see uh, the calls increased and, and the requests for, uh, I think, the identities of certain Twitter accounts increased as well. Um, the Saudi authorities have made absolutely uh, uh, no, um, no uh, uh, um, bones about it in terms of Twitter. Uh, they are interested in limiting free expression. They do not want Saudi uh, citizens to be able to go onto that platform and express themselves freely uh, to criticize the crown prince or to criticize uh, the crown prince's plans. Uh, and they've taken steps to limit it as much as possible, both through, you know, arresting Saudis directly for what they tweet, uh, but also, you know, engaging massive troll armies uh, to target uh, for harassment uh, dissidents and critics online. Uh, and now we see even a darker side, where it appears as though, at least at some point in time, they may have had the ability to unmask anonymous accounts uh, through uh, using contacts that were working directly for uh, Twitter. Uh, so this is very, very troubling. Uh, and it also reminds me uh, of a very dark tweet that was made by uh, the former royal court advisor Saul al-Ghattani who's also well known for his alleged role in the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi in October of 2018. Uh, he tweeted in August of 2017 uh, that, you know, Saudi citizens who wanted to tweet uh, criticism of the government through anonymous accounts were not safe. He tweeted that they had the ability to obtain their IP addresses. Uh, and he also said he had a secret way uh, of obtaining uh, their personal information that he was not going to say. And this was a tweet he made directly. I don't know if at that time, when 2017, that, that the Saudi authorities had had any sort of uh, ability to uh, get information directly from Twitter. I mean, obviously, the activity in the indictment is from 2014 to 2015, uh, but it certainly is very concerning. And, um, Adam, could you talk about um, some of the changes that uh, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman instituted within the security agencies, as a result of which he now directly uh, has appointed or oversees uh, precisely the people who are involved in these kinds of operations, and also how Saudi Arabia has deployed commercially available surveillance technologies to hack into the online accounts of government critics and dissidents, in particular 
Pegasus. Could you talk about that? So, when uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman uh, became Crown Prince in June of 2017, uh, we saw some massive shifts. Uh, and uh, most notably, uh, the authorities began to meticulously restructure the country's security agencies. Uh, they took uh, the previously very powerful and independent post of Minister of Interior, Ministry of Interior, and they removed the prosecution service as well as the uh, counterterrorism functions and the domestic intelligence agency, and, and created them all as separate agencies uh, reporting to and overseen directly by the royal court. They also purged uh, from the system uh, Mohammed bin Nayef and his loyalists, who had previously overseen the security, many of the security agencies. Uh, and they removed uh, other heads of agencies that were not loyal to uh, the king and the crown prince. Uh, after this was completed, over the summer of 2017, we immediately saw uh, a rapid escalation in the level of repression in Saudi Arabia, uh, beginning with mass arrests in 2017 of clerics, intellectuals, academics, uh, probably dozens, up to even hundreds of people. Uh, we saw in, in November of 2017 the, the so-called corruption arrests, whereby the authorities targeted businessmen, uh, current and former government officials, as well as royal family members, and held them uh, at the Ritz-Carlton. Uh, where they allegedly uh, mistreated them and uh, extorted them to hand over their financial assets in exchange for their freedom, continuing on through the arrests, the mass arrest of the women human rights activists in May uh, 2018, who were also held at an unofficial place of detention uh, and allegedly uh, subjected to pretty brutal torture. Uh, and this continued up through the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, and, you know, so we saw after that Mohammed bin Salman and his father reorganized the security agencies and had them firmly under their grip, they were able to immediately go and target uh, dissidents and activists and others, uh, going after them and, 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 and really arresting uh, people, uh, uh, wide ranges of people, uh, even people that were reformist and people that uh, nominally supported the Crown Prince's plans. I think what's interesting about the mass arrests uh, beginning in 2017 uh, to point out is that while obviously freedom of expression in Saudi Arabia has never been respected and Saudis have always been uh, targeted and arrested uh, who dared to criticize uh, government policies or cross red lines in their public speech, uh, what we saw after 2017 was really categorically different and much worse than what we had seen before, both in the sheer number and types of individuals who were arrested but also in the introduction of really pernicious and malicious abusive practices, uh, most notably, like I mentioned earlier, the holding of detainees at unofficial places of detention, where uh, allegations of mistreatment were pretty rampant, uh, including an allegation made by The New York Times that one uh, man died as the result of his treatment in the Ritz-Carlton. Uh, we've seen, of course, the, uh, the extortion of individuals to turn over their monetary and financial assets uh, in exchange for their freedom. Uh, we've also seen uh, the Saudi authorities go after family members of detainees, instituting arbitrary travel bans, threatening them uh, not to speak out, uh, and, and uh, this has continued. Now, one of, one of the other pernicious practices that it's important to point out is the, is the Saudi authorities uh, acquiring and use, apparent use of uh, advanced cyber surveillance software against Saudi activists and dissidents. Um, it seems clear uh, that uh, a Saudi, a well-known Saudi activist in, in Canada named Omar Abdelaziz, uh, he had his phone analyzed by an independent group, and they discovered on his phone a software called Pegasus, which is created by uh, a group called the NSO Group, based out of Israel. And this software essentially turns uh, the phone into a, a spying device. It allows whoever can access the phone to turn on the camera, to turn on the microphone, to see everything on the phone that the individual is doing. And what's really scary about the fact that they, that they uh, embedded this software into Omar's phone is that Omar was in touch with, it's no secret that Omar was in touch with Jamal Khashoggi uh, in the days and weeks before he died. So it's very possible that the authorities saw all of their exchanges that were going on uh, and their plans for you know, uh, uh, scaling up their activism in defense of uh, basic rights in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so, uh, in addition to Omar, we know that, uh, you know, two, uh, two or three other individuals have also claimed that they were the targets of Pe Pegasus attacks made by Saudi Arabia, 
including a, a researcher from Amnesty International in the UK uh, and another Saudi dissident living in London. Um, the fact that um, the Saudi authorities turn these products— Can you talk about products. what's happening with women? I mean, the fact that when uh, Mohammed bin Salman announced that women would be able to drive, the very women activists who'd been fighting for women to be able to drive were then imprisoned. Yes, that's absolutely correct, Amy. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman, in September of 2017, announced that women would be able to drive in 2018. Uh, and that very day, uh, somebody from a high-level government official called uh, the country's most uh, well-known women's rights activists and threatened them not to say a word about the end of the driving ban publicly, on Twitter or anywhere else. Uh, they seemed intent on not allowing the women to uh, claim credit for the reforms, even though th these are the women who put this issue on the map over, over years, as well as other uh, women's rights issues and discrimination against women in Saudi Arabia. And going beyond that, uh, they outright arrested uh, the leading activists, all of the leading activists, uh, beginning in May of 2018, just a, a mere week or two before the lifting of the driving ban. Uh, and, and this is what I was talking about earlier. While the authorities have, have, have attempted to justify their mass arrest by saying, oh, we're targeting only extremists, in fact, uh, many of the people that they're targeting are, are reformists and people who who absolutely support some of the uh, Crown Prince's policies. I think the authorities, by arresting the, the women human rights activists and subjecting them to uh, horrendous mistreatment, uh, as well as putting them on trial for a, a host of rather frivolous uh, actions that do not resemble recognizable crimes, uh, I think they're trying to send a clear message to Saudi society. Uh, that their input is unwanted, that the government is going to make its decisions, and that there's no space for any sort of civic activism uh, or, or citizens petitioning of their government for and positive Adam, reforms. And what message is being sent by those like Jared Kushner and Steve Mnuchin and the Energy Secretary Rick Perry and BlackRock and the other financial institutions represented at the so-called Davos in the desert, when so many were saying they should boycott what others called disgrace in the desert? 30 seconds on the significance of this, what this kind of meeting does for uh, bin Salman. Well, it's very challenging for me or any other Saudi watchers to see how there's going to be accountability for the abuses that we've seen under uh, uh, King Salman and Mohammed bin Salman, uh, when people seem to be returning to business as usual, despite the fact that there's been no accountability for any of the really, really terrible allegations of abuses that have come out, whether it be Jamal Khashoggi or the treatment of the women rights activists uh, and others. Uh, and uh, I think, unfortunately, this administration has sent uh, the Saudi leadership the signal that uh, they can essentially do what they want and that there won't be any, any real meaningful uh, pressure on them to reform or to end some of these uh, pernicious practices. And, you know, uh, I think it's, it's a real cause for concern that so many officials that boycotted the event last year uh, are returning, despite the fact that the Saudis have not made any real steps towards accountability. Adam Kugel, we want to thank you for being with us, Middle East researcher at Human Rights Watch. We'll link to your report, The High Cost of Change, Repression Under Saudi Crown Prince Tarnishes Reforms. This is Democracy Now! When we come back in 30 seconds, what's happening to the bees? Stay with us. Music from the documentary The Pollinators, composed by Douglas J. Cuomo. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We end today's show with a stinging new documentary that's already generating a lot of buzz. The film is called The Pollinators and features swarms of yellow black jacketed honeybees whose existence may determine the future of human survival. The insects pollinate nearly all the fruit, vegetables, and nuts we consume. Some experts estimate one out of every three bites of food we eat depends on the work of honeybees. 
But the future of the insects is now in peril, with widespread reports of bee colony collapses. In the last decade and a half, the nation's beekeepers have reported staggering declines in their bee populations due to pesticides, parasites and loss of habitat. Scientists warn climate change is also threatening the insect survival, noting that bees could die off at faster rates as the earth warms. This is the trailer for the new documentary, The Pollinators. Bees are so fascinating. When you first go into a beehive, you're like worried about getting stung. And then as soon as you start watching them and seeing them on the combs, communicating with each other, it's just so fascinating, so complex. And it mostly works until we get in the way of it. Populations of honeybees are dying at levels that are unprecedented and very concerning. Close to half of the colonies in the U.S. dying every single year. Native pollinators have disappeared and, and farming has become a lot bigger and so due to all this, you know, now they need beekeepers that can move bees from one place to the other. We can learn a good deal from bees about the health of the landscapes that we inhabit and we can learn a good deal about the folly of setting up our agriculture in quite the way that we have. The agriculture is an interruption of a natural system, but it can be done thoughtfully as an interruption of a natural system with great benefits. It's going to take 20, 30 years for that ground to get back in the shape it was to sustain life for all these wild insects, birds, and fowl, and everything else. Protecting the land around us, protecting the soil under us, is really our obligation. And from that, we get delicious, nourishing products. We've been pollinating fruits and vegetables and nuts for since the 70s, 60s, 50s, um, and we haven't had these kind of losses. We're not big beekeepers, we're just trying to hang on to our business. Well, for more, we're joined now by Peter Nelson, director of The Pollinators, also a beekeeper himself. Welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. A mass extinction of bees? Explain. Yeah, it's just the, the losses that beekeepers have been facing has been in the last—since uh, 2005, 2006, has really been somewhere between 30 and up to 50 percent, depending on where they are in the country, and it's a little alarming. And is that true just in the United States, or are uh, bees all over the world uh, experiencing this, or is it because here in the U.S. they use more pesticides? The bees, there's a, there's a worldwide loss of insects, and I think that's been documented. Um, but here in the United States, because of their exposure to pesticides in agriculture, it's particularly pronounced. Let's turn to an excerpt from the film The Pollinators, beginning with Susan Kegley of the Pesticide Research Institute. Many crops require pollination by insects. And because the native pollinators who used to be here are no longer in large enough quantities to do that pollination, the managed honeybees have stepped in to take the, the role of pollinator. Well, pollination is a basic natural function. A lot of plants in nature need insects to transfer pollen. And one of the most efficient is the honeybee. So basically, you know, all the good stuff we eat, you know, the vegetables and the fruits and so on, most of that needs honeybee pollination or pollination by native pollinators. The chemical companies, they figure we should eat corn, soybeans and rice and that don't need to be pollinated. And that's what they think we ought to live on. But if you like your fruits and vegetables and your nuts, a lot of that stuff need pollinated. Um, a lot of wild insects can do the job, but not as well as bringing in a commercial beekeeper to put down a thousand colonies in one area and give a good blast to the pollination. Our business has got two different ends to it. One of them is producing honey, but of course the reason the honey bees are here in the first place is to pollinate our crops, you know, because one out of every three bites of food we put in our mouths is, comes from honey bee pollination. I think the general public should know that our food system is threatened by the fact that the bees are in trouble. And they should care about that because they eat food. And this is another clip from The Pollinators featuring beekeeper Dave Hackenberg, who is among the first beekeepers to sound the alarm about bee colony collapse disorder in 2006. So the problem is that native pollinators have disappeared and, and farming has become a lot bigger. And so due to all this, you know, now they need beekeepers that can move bees from one place to the other. And of course, the only bees that are really movable that you can put on the back of a truck and truck them all over the place is honeybees. 
an excerpt of the pollinators. Um, Peter Nelson, how does Europe deal with bees differently than the United States? Well, the European Union has placed a ban on neonicotinoid pesticides, which is huge. In fact, they just recently strengthened it because they didn't have they had, the science was showing that it was working. And uh, here we have a different setup. The, the precautionary principle that the European Union uses says that we really need to test these pesticides or fungicides or herbicides or whatever before they go into the environment to make sure they're entirely safe. And here we have kind of a different approach where we have oftentimes the, the chemical companies are doing the testing themselves and, and doing their getting their own results, and they get a conditional registration, which allows them to use the pesticides without being fully tested in the field, which, and that's a law that's they're bound by the EPA. And in the film, uh, uh, Peter, many people, including Bill McKibben, talk about the fact that bees, uh, the, the, the collapse of the bee population, is just uh, one instance of what is to come. Why is uh, what's going on now with bees a harbinger of what might come later? Well, honeybees are studied more than a lot of other insects and bees, and so, so the, the, we have data on them. And, and since they're so so well studied and documented, if the losses are like that on honeybees, it brings up the question: What's going else? What else is going on in nature with other species, with other insects? And it's important to know that honeybees are only one of four thousand species of bees in North America. I want to go to Bill McKibben, uh, co-founder of 350.org, who you interview yeah. in The Pollinators. We can learn a good deal from bees about the health of the landscapes that we inhabit. And sort of secondarily, we can learn a good deal about the folly of setting up our agriculture in quite the way that we have. It looked so efficient and concentrate everything in the ways that we've done it. But that turns out to be a false efficiency. It is the cheapest way to produce pork or corn or whatever else. But that cheapness comes at a high price, and that price is the loss of the agricultural diversity, uh, redundancy, uh, resiliency that is really beyond price. Uh, you know, it's the thing that we've built up over 10,000 years of agriculture, and now in a kind of hundred years of industrialization, we've managed to get rid of most of it. That's Bill McKibben in The Pollinators. Peter Nelson, you, too, are a beekeeper. Um, talk about—you're talking about um, uh, pesticides and how they're used in this country, also the whole issue of the climate crisis. Yeah, totally. It's—bees it's, uh, are an indicator species, so we really need to pay attention to what's going on, because our agricultural system is really dependent upon these commercial bees. You know, agriculture has gotten much more simplified, more monocultures, more chemically dependent, and so it's required to bring these bees in, because so many of the native bees that would traditionally have done pollination are not able to live there anymore. So it's become essential to bring these bees in, almost as an insurance policy for much of agriculture. And the agriculture that uses bees? Oh, it's 400 crops that uh, that we eat. It's the most nutritious and nourishing things that we eat. It's the fruits and nuts and vegetables that we eat. Things like wheat and corn are wind-pollinated, rice is wind-pollinated, but the, the nutritious, uh, you know, foods that we have are mostly pollinated by bees. I want to thank you so much for being with us, Peter Nelson, director of the new documentary, The Pollinators, and that does it for today's show. On Friday, Democracy Now! will be broadcasting and live streaming the first-ever presidential forum on environmental justice at South Carolina State University in Orangeburg. Candidates taking part so far include Senators Elizabeth Warren and Cory Booker, businessman Tom Steyer, um, as well as Marianne Williamson and others. I'll be moderating with former EPA official Mustafa Ali. You can watch it as we live stream at democracynow.org beginning Friday evening at 6 p.m. Eastern. Also, television stations and radio stations will be running it across the country. We'll also be broadcasting from Orangeburg, from South Carolina State, tomorrow morning. Democracy Now! Democracy Now! currently accepting applications for paid six month internships here in New York. Learn more at Democracy Now! Org. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Dina Geister, Carla, Sam, Carla Wills, Libby Rainey, Sam Alkoff, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Hani Basud, Trina Nadura, Tay Maria Studio, Maria Tarasena. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Thank you.